Hello and welcome to our last discussion of Dalloway Day 2022, the fifth year of the RSL's Dalloway Day. I'm Molly Rosenberg, Director of the Royal Society of Literature, and I'm very happy to welcome you today from wherever you're watching to celebrate Virginia Woolf's life and work alongside the RSL and our partners, the British Library. You can catch more on Dalloway Day through our friends, BBC Radio 3. Today, you join us for a party planning panel discussion between Merve Emery, L Elaine Showalter, Carbe Wilson and Irena Sinekoji. Mrs. Dalloway's party is one of literature's best known social occasions, but what if Virginia Woolf herself had been the hostess? Who would have been on the guest list? What would they have talked about? Our speakers will tell us who they think would have made the cut and why, and their whole discussion will be introduced with a poetry performance from Carbe interrogating class and capitalism in Mrs. Dalloway. If you're looking after this for more things Dalloway, Head to the Royal Society of Literature's website for more events from this year and previous years, or visit our partners, the British Library for Virginia Woolf manuscripts and articles online. Before Carbe, I am welcoming Irenison Okoji, who will be guiding conversation today. Irenison is a Nigerian British writer. Elected to the Royal Society of Literature as a fellow in 2018, her short stories have been published internationally. Her debut novel, Butterfly Fish, was published in 2015, for which she was a recipient of a 2016 Betty Trask Award. Her short story collection, Speak Gargantula, was published in 2016. It was shortlisted for the inaugural Jalak Prize and the 2017 Edge Hill Short Story Prize. A collection of short stories, Nudie Brank, was published in 2019. It was again longlisted for the Jalak Prize in 2020. The story Grace Jones won the 2020 AKO Kane Prize for African Writing. In 2021, she was awarded an MBE for Services to Literature. Very well deserved, I can say. Um, a novel, Kurandira, is forthcoming this year in 2022. She is Vice Chair of the Royal Society of Literature's Governing Council. And before Irenison, we'll have an introduction from Carbe Wilson. Maid, Prime Minister, Servant, Prime Minister, Cook, Prime Minister, Cook, Maid, Cook, Cook, Servant, Maid, Cook, Maid, Maid, Servant, 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 Hired Help, Old Nurse, Old Nurse, Lady, Lady, Old Nurse, Old Nurse, Lady, Old Nurse, Old Nurse, Lady, Old Nurse, Lady, Lady, Hired Help, Lady, Sir, Lady, Colonial Administrator, Colonial Administrator, Lord, Colonial Administrator, Colonial Administrator, Lord, Lady, Lord, Vicar, Maids, politicians, member of parliament, member of parliament, member of parliament, member of parliament, colonial administrator, colonial administrator, colonel, royal servant, lady, hired help, painter, lady, 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 member of parliament, lady, hired help, hired help, hired help, prime minister, colonial administrator, prime minister, member of parliament, lady, prime minister, colonial administrator, royal servant, royal servant, colonial administrator, court footman, Royal Servant, Colonial Administrator, Royal Servant, Royal Servant, Colonial Administrator, Royal Servant, Prime Minister, Lady, Lady, Prime Minister, Prime Minister, Lady, Colonial Administrator, Member of Parliament, Colonial Administrator, Prime Minister, History Teacher, History Teacher, Member of Parliament, Psychiatrist, Lady, Painter, 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 Maid, Professor, Poet, Professor, Professor, Poet, Poet, Professors, Professor, Poet, Professor, 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 Lord, Lord, Lords, Artists, Colonial Administrator, Lord, Member of Parliament, Colonial Administrator, Colonial Administrator, Colonial Administrator, Member of Parliament, Lady, Colonial Administrator, Colonial Administrator, Member of Parliament, Lady, Member of Parliament, Lady, Lady, Colonial Administrator, Lady, Member of Parliament, Colonial Administrator, Lady, Colonial Administrator, Vice Roys. Prime Minister, Prime Minister, Lady, Colonial Administrator, Sir, Servants, 
Lady, lady, colonial administrator. Lady, lady, colonial administrator. Lady, lady, colonial administrator. Lady, housemaid. Royal servant, royal servant, Portuguese ambassador. Factory owner. Lady, colonial administrator, member of parliament, German teacher. Lady, colonial administrator, psychiatrist. Lady, 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 psychiatrist, member of parliament, member of parliament, psychiatrist, psychiatrist. Lady, lady, psychiatrist, psychiatrist, member of parliament, psychiatrist, member of parliament, psychiatrist. Lady, psychiatrist, soldier, psychiatrist, soldier. Prime minister, lady, prime minister, lady, psychiatrist, lady, soldier. Psychiatrist, lady, soldier, soldier, soldier. Psychiatrist, lady, soldier. Colonial administrator, lady, soldier. Psychiatrist, soldier. Psychiatrist, member of parliament, soldier. Lady, soldier, soldier. Lady, colonial administrator, colonial administrator, lady, lady, colonial administrator. Politicians, member of parliament, lady, merchants, manufacturers, lady, colonial administrator, lady, lady, colonial administrator. Member of Parliament, Member of Parliament, Member of Parliament, Colonial Administrator, Colonial Administrator, Lady, Factory Owner, Colonial Administrator, Servants, Lady, Factory Owner, Lady, Queen France, Lady, Queen France, Colonial Administrator, Lady, Colonial Administrator, Lady, Lady, Colonial Administrator, Colonial Administrator, Member of Parliament, Royal Servant, Lady, Royal Servant, Royal Servant, Colonial Administrator, Royal Servant, Colonial Administrator, Colonial Administrator, Lady, Colonial Administrator, Royal servant, royal servant, royal servant, royal servant, colonial administrator, lady, colonial administrator, lady, colonial administrator, lady, factory owner, colonial administrator, factory owner, lady, gardener, lady, colonial administrator, lady, colonial administrator, lady, colonial administrator, colonial administrator, colonial administrator, colonial administrator, lady, colonial administrator, lady, colonial administrator, member of parliament, lady, colonial administrator, lady, member of parliament, lady. Psychiatrist, colonial administrator, psychiatrist, member of parliament, lady, lady, colonial administrator, lady, colonial administrator, lady, colonial administrator, lady, psychiatrist, lady, member of parliament, psychiatrist, lady, colonial administrator, lady, psychiatrist, lady, psychiatrist, colonial administrator, lady, colonial administrator, lady, colonial administrator, lady, 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 colonial administrator, lady, member of parliament, member of parliament, member of parliament. Psychiatrist, lady, member of parliament, member of parliament, member of parliament, lady, lady, colonial administrator. I'm thrilled to be moderating this Dalloway Day event for the RSL in partnership with the British Library, celebrating the ever fascinating, inspiring Virginia Woolf, a writer who remains indelible in our imaginations, whose body of work continues to enrich our literary landscape. Today, we explore what would happen if Virginia Woolf threw a dinner party open to any guests throughout history. Joining me to discuss this scintillating topic are three brilliant writers, Merve Emre, Elaine Showalter, and Carbe Wilson. I'd like to introduce our guests without further ado. Merve Emre is Associate Professor of English at the University of Oxford. She is the author of Para Literary, The Making of Bad Readers in Postwar America, The Ferrante Letters, and The Personality Brokers, which was selected as one of the best books of 2018 by the New York Times, The Economist, NPR, and CBC, and informs the CNN HBO Max documentary feature film, Persona. She is the editor of the annotated Mrs. Dalloway and the Norton Modern Library, Mrs. Dalloway. Elaine Showalter is a professor emerita at Princeton and former chair of the judges of the Booker International Prize. Her books include a literature of their own, British women novelists from Bronte to Lessing, and a jury of her peers, American women writers from Annie Bradstreet to Annie Prelew, between women, the correspondence between Winifred Holtby and Vera Britton, edited by Elaine Showalter and English Showalter, which will be published by Virago later this year. She is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and one of the instigators of Dalloway Day. Carbe Wilson is a UK multimedia artist with a particular focus on adaptation across different forms. His work on Virginia Woolf includes The Dreadlock Hosts, 
a performance piece that adapted and inverted the infamous dreadnought host of 1910, Olivia Nguafri, of One Woman or So, an extended experiment in literary recycling. And more recently, On Being Still, the Modernist Review 25, a series of paintings and writings that scrutinizes his own engagement with the Bloomsbury Group within the context of COVID-19 pandemic and Black Lives Matter. More information about his work can be found at arcable.com. He's also very excited because one of his paintings will be used for the cover of To The Lighthouse, which is fantastic. Congratulations, Carve. Uh, so I'm so excited conversation with you guys. Uh, this is potentially hugely exciting. Virginia Woolf, much loved author, uh, famous for her works, you know, um, Orlando, Mrs. Dalloway, um, A Room of One's Own. But what would happen if she threw a dinner party and who would make the guest list? Uh, I'm going to come to Merve first of your inspired choice of Tilda Swinton, which I think is an amazing choice, actually. I mean, she, of course, is known for being uh, a singular actress and unique presence uh, in the art scene, uh, particularly known for films such as Orlando, which she completely, I think, embodied that main protagonist through different time periods so brilliantly. And of course, we need to talk about Kevin, who could forget that performance. So she is somebody I feel the guests would be drawn to <laughs> because she is otherworldly. So could you talk us through this brilliant choice, Merve? I will, but I will start maybe by saying that I was struck that I only invited one guest, whereas <laughs> Elaine, Elaine and Parpe invited multiple guests. So I think maybe that speaks to either my anti-sociality as a host or my sense that Virginia Woolf might have wanted a more intimate kind of party. I chose Tilda Swinton for two reasons. Uh, one, which you've already mentioned, is her extreme presence and an extreme presence that I think is very interestingly tied to all kinds of ambiguities around gender and around sexuality. And it is of course impossible to talk about Virginia Woolf, I think, without bringing up questions of gender and sexuality. And Tilda Swinton for me is someone who really gets at part of Woolf's, um, part of Woolf's queerness part of Wolf's androgyny and does that in a kind of hyper aestheticized, very, very, very stylish, but still kind of aloof and reserved way. And when I think of Wolf, that combination of style, reserve, androgyny and queerness is exactly where I place her as a figure and as a writer. So that's one reason. The other reason uh, was that I was thinking a little bit about one of my favorite essays about, about Mrs. Dalloway's party, which is Alex Zwerdling's great essay, Virginia Woolf and the Social System, in which Zwerdling makes the argument that the party is on the one hand a party, but it's also a kind of wake. And it's a wake for a particular version or a particular moment in the history of the British empire. And I thought, who do I know or who can I think of that can straddle that boundary between being alive and being dead? And I thought about how Tilda Swinton has also played a vampire, how she has also played a disembodied voice in Derek Jarman's incredible movie, Blue, and how she seems to me in being alive, one of those characters whose presence manage, manages to transcend living. I, maybe that's what it means for someone to be iconic. So in terms of who really would capture that sense of the party as both party and wake, I thought about Tilda Swinton. And maybe the last thing that I will say is that anytime I read that wonderful passage where the prime minister is being described at the party, all rigged up in gold lace and being paraded around the room by Clarissa Dalloway, I think of Tilda Swinton. She is, to me, the prime minister rigged up in gold lace, and then she immediately transitions into a court footman 
surrounded by rattles and baubles and growing white in old age. And then she immediately transitions into Sally Seton and she just cycles through all of the other characters that are at that party. So that's my that's my offering to use a very Wolfian term. That's my that's my offering of Tilda Swinton and my reason for it. Thank you so much. That was beautifully put. Um, I, I think underlining that is that she is transformative, <laughs> you know, both both as a, a personality and an actress. And she definitely, I think, would embody somebody that would bring a certain dynamism to that party. Uh, and again, has that element of mystery. Like you say, there is that quality where you don't quite know her because she would be able to play so many different characters. So she would bring an amazing dynamic um, to, to that party. Uh, Elaine, I think you wanted to chime in, please do. I, I just want, I wanted to comment on this and especially um, since you, you've chosen uh, this, this one character, but obviously you can build on that. I'm wondering what you think of some of the other um, actresses who have played either Mrs. Dalloway or Virginia Woolf. So what do you think of, in, in their film, would you invite Vanessa Redgrave? And what about Nicole Kidman and the nose? Yeah. I have to hear what you think of that. Uh, yeah, well, Vanessa Red Redgrave, certainly, but also who plays the young Clarissa, Natasha? McElhone? Yes, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, great actress. I think, I think you'd have to invite both of them and you'd have to have them wearing the same the same dress and probably the dress that Elizabeth is described as at, as wearing at the party a little bit later on. Um, I think, you know, yes, you would invite that whole trio from the hours, Julianne Moore, Meryl Streep yeah. and Nicole yeah. Kidman, but I think you'd have to, you'd have to encourage Nicole Kidman to leave the nose at home. Well, that's very key. What would happen to the nose? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> the nose would maybe be a nice centerpiece. <laughs> a punch bowl around yeah. the nose, but no, that yeah. prosthetic never quite worked for, never quite worked for me. Uh, there seemed to be a, a level of artificiality to it that was impossible to to overlook. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. a great question, though. That's a wonderful question. That's a lovely question. And all amazing actresses, actually. Can you imagine them all at the party? But yeah, I think that the nose would have to have its own allocated seating, I think, by the sounds <laughs> of things. Um, Elaine, I want to come to you next for your first two suggested guests, which are Winifred Holtby and Vera Britton, uh, both incredibly accomplished women in their own rights, you know, uh, both journalists and novelists, but also friends. And I love this idea of this duo um, who could potentially perhaps cause some disruption um, at the party. We know that Winfred, for example, um, wrote the first critique of Virginia Woolf. So she wasn't yeah, afraid yeah. to get on Woolf's bad sides. Uh, so I just wondered if you could talk us through those choices because they're both fascinating. Thanks. Well, you know, I really wanted, uh, when I thought about the party list, my mind immediately went, and this probably says something about me, to, to people who would be unwelcome guests. People, people who Virginia Woolf would probably never have thought of inviting. And, you know, at Mrs. Dalloway's party, there's Ellie Henderson, who feels she was invited at the last minute, and she was. But that's as close as it gets to a, a really unwanted guest. Um, and Winifred Holtby and Vera Britton, who uh, were friends and formed a kind of almost iconic feminist friendship that lasted until Winifred's death in 1935, um, they lived together, although Vera Britton was married and had two children, and it was not a menage a trois, much more complicated than that. But um, the interesting thing about them is that when, when Vera Britton and, and Winifred Holtby first met at Oxford, Somerville College, Oxford, right after the war, um, they had plans to come to London, which they did, and begin their lives as writers, as journalists, as intellectuals, um, as young working women in London. And all the time that they did from the very beginning until the peak of their career, certainly when Winifred died, they were painfully aware that they did not belong to Bloomsbury. The first place they lived was actually sort of marginally in Bloomsbury, but they were, you know, physically, but they were not of Bloomsbury. And they were quite bitterly aware of Wolf and Bloomsbury and the whole crowd and the gang and parties they might be having 
to which, you know, Vera and Winifred would never be invited. Uh, it was partly a thing about class. Um, they were both upper middle class Americans would say, um, but Bloomsbury was its own kind of, you know, aristocracy and had a, its own lineage and genealogy. And they were very bitter about that because they, they had to make their own way. They were trying to network in literary London, in journalistic London. And in the beginning, to me, it's very touching, you know, how they, how they grasped at what we would call, you know, fifth level celebrities or fifth level, and they were so thrilled to have that kind of connection. Uh, but obviously, uh, Bloomsbury, when, when um, Winifred Holtby, this, this is the book that she wrote about Virginia Woolf, fairly substantial, and it's really good. This came out in 1933. Um, Virginia Woolf, a very different kind of writer from Winifred Holtby, who was basically a realist. Um, but Holtby really got it about Woolf. Um, she understood about her feminism. She understood about her techniques. She is totally on Woolf's side. It's, it's really, I think it stands up really well. Very, very good critical book. And so in a way that was her ticket to get to meet Virginia Woolf, which she did three times. She interviewed her three times. Most of the time uh, she didn't get to meet her. Um, and she relied on Ethel, she had an, they had a, a, an intermediary and she got information from her. Um, they had a little bit of correspondence. And when the biography came out, um, Wolf actually quite liked it. She was really impressed. She had not expected that she was gonna be impressed, but she was. Um, and she said, you know, I, I thought it was uh, so impressive that, you know, maybe I should write about this Virginia Wolf. Wolf said, you know, jestingly. On the other hand, Wolf was incredibly nasty in her letters about uh, Winifred Holtby herself. And she said, uh, it, it's really quite dreadful. She said, uh, Holtby of course is an amiable donkey. And she made a kind of really cruel remark about how Holtby had learned to read in the pigsties at her father's farm. Um, Holtby grew up in Yorkshire. Her father was a very prosperous farmer. I mean, there's nothing that justifies this kind of nasty remark. So I kind of like the idea that Winifred would be there and she and Vera Britton were, actually they had so much in common with Virginia Woolf. They were feminists, they were socialists, they were pacifists. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing that didn't mesh, but it would have been kind of jarring to have them there. And Vera Britton herself, Winifred too, they both cared a lot about fashion. They would have worried for days about what to wear to the party. So I think it would be kind of a great juxtaposition. I love that. I consider them, you know, two literary disruptors um, yeah. at this party <laughs> who, who were right. probably unexpected in that environment. But I also love that they had this really amazing friendship so they could rely on each other through through difficult times. Um, and yeah. like you said, it sounds like there was a real ad admiration of Wolf, um, you know, on, on both on both their parts. It's just a shame that class was a factor in in the way she regarded them. Um, but, you know, th there is this fascinating element to Wolf that there's this dichotomy where, you know, she could be incredibly gracious, but also quite mean spirited as yeah. well. So I can imagine some quite pointed, pithy, <laughs> pithy yeah. remarks um, at that dinner dinner table conversation. No, lo lovely suggestions. Carbe, I want to come to you, bring you in. Um, this amazing uh, suggestion of Toni Morrison as a guest. Um, incredible writer, obviously, um, you know, exceptional work capturing uh, the Black American experience in such an expansive virtuosic way and unapologetic way as well. Um, jazz is a book that changed my life. <laughs> so I'm, I'm all for this choice. Um, and I'd love to hear more about um, your decision to have her as a guest. Um, yeah, I was just, I, I had something I would like to uh, ask Elaine, first of all, if that's okay, just in terms of the Vera Britton um, suggestion. Uh, it's just because, I, yeah, I read, I read uh, Wolf's kind of quite short uh, critique or response of Testament of Youth. 
and I, I was quite yeah I, I was I was quite interested about the, the the kind of the angle and the phrasing that she 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 took on it she seemed to kind of positive maybe she said that she was jealous about it um something that I've always kind of had in the background thinking about Jacob's room is this question of it being an, an elegy for Toby but yeah. in actual fact we know that if he would have survived there's a good chance that he wouldn't have gone to war um and I kind of just I like the idea of you inviting Vera Britain and potentially there being a tension there Wolf may be getting a bit chippy you know she maybe has a bit of a chip on her shoulder about the idea that that Vera Britain this is someone who you know in terms of her pacifism is actually um she's been on the front line effectively she's actually gone she's you know she's been as she says like having her hand in in you know people's bodies and stuff um whereas Wolf's is much you know Three Guineas is a much more kind of um distanced academic text or is it academic but you know it's it's, it's incredibly it's an incredible work of pacifism but it, it it differs from testaments of youth in that way so I yeah I was very intrigued to whether you think that there might be a kind of like a, a tension yeah. there from most point of view. Yeah I mean it's really interesting to say I mean of course well, Winifred Holtby had also been a nurse um, during the war, but she was in a very different uh, part of France than Vera Britain. Vera Britain was really on, in the trenches and at the front and saw a terrible suffering, terrible wounds. Um, but they, she was there. And Testament of Youth is, is not the only, but certainly the most powerful and notable memoir of World War I written by a woman. And tremendously impressive, and and it has a presence. Of course, Wolf, inconceivable. You cannot imagine uh, Virginia Wolf being on the front in any way, being in a trench in any way. Um, although she certainly experienced the war emotionally and did lose uh, relatives in the war very painfully. The other thing about both uh, Vera and, and Winifred, of course, is that they had gone to Oxford, something that Wolf never was able to do. And then I think she always, certainly in a, in a room of one's own, I mean, always feeling, was excluded from and imagines what it might have been like. They were actually there at Somerville College, which was the center of um, literary feminism um, for a long time uh, at Oxford. So. In, in a lot of ways, they represented something that she couldn't share. But I love the sense of, of the war memory. She was very impressed by it. And she read Testament of Experience, too, which was the book Vera wrote about Winifred after Winifred died. And she said, to her credit, in a way, she said Winifred was a much more important person and a much um, more distinguished person than even Vera, her closest friend, would acknowledge. So it fills it all out. Glad you noticed that. Thank you. Um, yeah, and in terms of Toni Morrison, I, I think my selection there was much less about um, uh, the idea of tension so much as I think Toni would maybe want to meet Virginia Woolf. Um, I mean, I'm going to be honest, my first yeah. instinct was kind of like, how can yeah. I get invited to this party? You know, who can I, who can I, who can <laughs> I pick? Put, why didn't you put yourself on the well, list? I just thought, you know, maybe you should have put your name on, on the list. list. <laughs> yeah. To, uh, to I think back. we all deserve to be on the list, <laughs> yeah, right? So, right? Let's yeah. just assume that we're all invited, I think, yeah. as well. <laughs> But but Morrison, Morrison did write a chapter of her MA dissertation yeah. on Wolf, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, th so this was yeah. So yeah. this was actually where where my kind of uh, thought process came from because what I wanted to do was, in terms of the time travel option we have here, is mm -hmm. specifically pick Toni Morrison as the Howard professor. So not necessarily later in her life, um, but what I have, well, I mean, my interest in in Wolf in a lot of ways, my research interest and creatively has been looking at the 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 times that she appears in in history and in culture where we don't expect her to be there and um and that's a particularly uh, names is is a, is a is a like a framework through through which i look at that and uh, yeah i've done some work connecting wolf with stokely carmichael um you know the civil rights activist black panther and and such and uh my aim there was looking at the idea of Mary Carmichael in River One's Own and then Stokely Carmichael and then seeing if I could build up these connections between the two, between Wolf and Carmichael. And one of the things that I came up with was that Toni Morrison was one of the figures that connects them because, as Mervé says, Toni Morrison, you know, she was a Wolf scholar um, earlier in her career and uh, she taught Stokely Carmichael at Howard. And what's really fascinating to me is that you, you can read these stories about about Carmichael being kind of at the front of the class and being very, you know, the kind of figure he was. He was very like a, uh, you know, he would interrupt and he would make these claims and say, well, why, are we, why are we studying this? There's an amazing story I read about uh, Tony Morrison had set 
a, a Faulkner novel for them to read. And Carmichael said, why are we reading this racist old white man when we should be talking about like, you know, colonialism? And, you know, she kind of shuts him down. Um, so I feel quite sure that at some point, Toni Morrison would have taught A Room of One's Own or some other wolf text to Stokely Carmichael. So I have this idea that I'd like to write maybe a short story about the idea of that class. He reads A Room of One's Own and he, he sees the name Mary Carmichael. Much later in his life, we know that he changed his name uh, and he changed his name to Kwame Ture. It's, you know, in terms of African heritage, his inspiration of uh, African leaders. Um, so he's rejecting, you know, he's rejecting Stokely Carmichael and also his middle name was Winston. Which, uh, sorry, no, it's, Win it's Churchill. One of his middle names is Churchill. So he's rejecting this, you know, as his, as his slave name. I'm wondering whether Carmichael in a room one's own would have been one of the first times he sees that name. Mm -hmm. So in this lesson, if we imagine Wolf's telling this and he's saying we're saying you know who is this Carmichael why are we supposed to you know why are we supposed to associate or or kind of um think positively about this Mary Carmichael like what were her cousins doing her cousins were probably you know the the my slave ancestors and I think Tony Morrison says well actually Stokely I've just had this very interesting invitation to a party that Virginia Woolf is throwing back in time why don't you come along I'll introduce you I'd like to meet her and then we can see what kind of conversation gets going there so this was this was sort of my, my, my thinking that I think Toni Morrison would really like to talk to Wolf. I think, you know, she has a particular interest in Mrs. Dalloway's party. She writes about that in, in her thesis. Um, and then she would say on, and, you know, here's my, here's my, one of my brightest students and he's got some questions for you. So the, another, another point of, uh, of maybe a developing friendship, but also possibly some tension in, in the party guests. Lovely. I love that. I love that. I, I mean, the combination of, of Tony and Stokely together um, yeah. at this party would be, be very, very interesting, I think. And I think you're right. I think there would be a real curiosity um, from certainly from Tony's part, because she was a real intellectual, um, as we know, not just a great writer, but an exceptional thinker. Um, so that that combination could I think potentially be quite fiery, having mm. seen Tony in interviews. Mm. <laughs> Um, I think there could be some interesting tension there, but I mean, it's it's a it's a dream, dreamy list to, to have both her and Stokely involved. And of course, Stokely heavily um, participated in um, advocating black rights in America and did that, I think, transformative trip of going outside of the US to talk to leaders outside, you know, revolutionary leaders to, to kind of pick their brains and find out about, you know, their frameworks and how they see the world and, you know, how they want to empower um, perhaps people who are disenfranchised. So, I mean, fascinating to have him there as a guest. Um, Merve, you wanted to chime in, please do. Well, the way that Carve is, is, is thinking uh, made, me, made me think of a book whose manuscript I just read by the wonderful Wolf scholar, Elizabeth Abel. It's called Odd Affinities. And it traces Wolf's influence on, uh, on African-American writers. And the two that come to mind that would also make very good party guests are Nella Larson, whose passing Elizabeth Abel reads as a kind of rewriting of Mrs. Dalloway. Wow. And, and a fascinating reading in part because there are lines from Mrs. Dalloway that Larson is taking almost verbatim. Mm. So I think it would be interesting to invite someone who walks that line between uh, acolyte or someone who is influenced and a kind of quasi plagiarist to Virginia Woolf party. And then the other person that Elizabeth reads as having this kind of odd affinity with Wolf is James Baldwin. Mm. And she reads Giovanni's room as a kind of rewriting of Jacob's mm. room. And I think to add Nella Larson and Baldwin to this mix of people who have the kinds of odd affinities with Wolf that you're describing, Carve would also make for a really interesting, interesting guest list. Mm. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, actually, I was thinking of my own guests that I would have loved to add to the list, and James Baldwin um, and Josephine Baker were two people that I would <laughs> I would put forward yeah. as guests. Uh, I mean, James obviously a trailblazer um, in terms of being uh, a Black American gay activist and, and writer who, who left the States having been frustrated with the way um, you know, Black Americans were being treated to, to live in France and that whole experience of 
spending time away from the US as a black man, but still being connected to what was happening and still being personally very affected by it. Um, and also just an astonishing thinker again. So I, I know that he's somebody who would be critical I think, uh, and perhaps cause some tension as well. But there would be a real interest in Wolf and a real curiosity. Um, and Josephine Baker, I think, is just, you know, this is a woman who had several lives, <laughs> not only uh, an actress, a performer, an activist, a, a, but a wonderful humanitarian. And also at one point, an intelligence officer for the French. Mm. So I think as a guest, that's a fascinating um, element to, to have in the mix and, and could potentially be, again, um, you know, quite, uh, quite exciting to have all, all, all these wonderful, eclectic characters in conversation. Elaine, you want to chime in? Um, Mary Faye, did you have something to say? I thought you, you looked like you were going to say something to say about Toni Morrison first. Well I, well, I was actually going to go to a Renaissance comment about Josephine Baker, who also appears in Nella Larson's passing. So mm -hmm. to have all of these people in the same space would create a very yeah. nice kind of closed circle. But I just wanted to point out how interesting it is that our guest lists are more or less kind of cool uh, modernists, except for yours, Elaine, where you have the realists coming in as like the 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 agitators. And I just I I, I was thinking of other realists that we might want to toss in to be the you know yeah. be the other crowd, the out crowd at the at the party. The other thing is Toni Morrison was at was at Princeton when I was at Princeton. It was a colleague of mine at Princeton. She is a great party giver. I have to say, she would be the life of the party. And she was one of these people, you know, who brought out the party person and everybody else. And while she was at Princeton, she instituted, um, I think after she won the Nobel Prize and Princeton, you know, wanted to honor in various ways. And what she asked for was to start something that was called the Princeton Atelier, in which two artists from very different fields were brought together to collaborate. And that went on for a number of years, very interesting pairings um, that she had together. So I, I think the first one she actually was herself, she, somebody picked her and she had her poems set to music and performed by Andre Previn, try to imagine this. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was an interesting thing. And she would be, she'd be great. I think she would be a wonderful presence at anybody's party. Yeah, there are there are photos of Toni Morrison at parties, I think, uh, yeah. on the internet, and she's having a really good time. So yeah. she seems to be somebody who would probably be the life of the party, I reckon. Um, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful choice. Um, Elaine, I want to come back to you, uh, your second choice of Noel Coward um, as a guest. I mean, this is a, a polymath whose wit and flamboyance would be a massive, massive draw. So talk us through um, Noel as your second choice. Yeah, I, I really, you know, I don't even have that much to say about Noel Coward. I put him in because he was at the center of a sort of very different, um, I don't know, gay, gay culture. Again, I thought he was a kind of, um, I don't know, the entertainment world, something that Wolf doesn't engage with, one of her, one of her blind spots, so to speak, or you, you don't get that sense of her being there. And I was also, I kind of link him with Rebecca West, very different kind of personality, but also as um, somebody kind of with some of, with, with a lot of things in common with Wolf, but also kind of an outrageous person, Rebecca West. And as with, um, with Winifred Holtbury, uh, Wolf was not at all impressed by, uh, by Rebecca West and wrote an incredibly nasty thing about her too. She said about, about Rebecca West, as tenacious as a terrier with flashing eyes, very shabby, dirty nails, and it goes on. I mean, Wolf, in a way you think, you, you, you don't really want to be around Wolf that much to, to get into the letters. But I think that Rebecca West could have stood up for herself. That's the thing. You're going to have to be protective of Rebecca West. And by the time um, Wolf was writing, uh, way before Wolf was writing Mrs. Dalloway, Rebecca West had published one of the first novels about the war. Um, 
and in 1918, and, and was sort of a bit ahead of the game. So she too had written about the effect of, of war and shell shock on, on male identity. Um, there are so many, so many potential pairings, right? So many conversations you can imagine um, that, that Wolf might not have, have sought out. Yeah. Do you think, Elaine, just do you think that there was perhaps a competitive element there with Wolf and people she was mean towards, other women that she was mean towards? Because, um, you know, I'm, I'm imagining at, at that time that there probably weren't many women writers being published and you would, you would hope that there would be some sort of shared affinity there, some sort of sense of community. So I yeah. wondered if it was a way of her kind of keeping people who may be a threat in, in their place, because we know that she has this side to her where she can be yeah. gracious, but also quite vicious. Well, it is really interesting. Of course, of course this Vita Sackville West, um, you know, the great example, uh, who, who obviously would have been at any party, and you know, if there were such a thing, she would have been there. Um, but there's a fairly small list of people who were accepted into the, the canon of, of, of women writers. And I'm sure they were competitive. I don't know if Wolf thought of it as being competitive. They thought of it as being competitive for sure. Well, she, yeah. well, she thought of it. I mean, you could you could put together a great guest list uh, based on just people she said nasty things about in her. Yes, well, that, you know, would, that would overflow. <laughs> You'd have to have it. And, you know. But, you know, I was thinking like if you really wanted to rankle her, uh, yeah. Catherine Mansfield, with yeah. whom she feel quite competitive, Elizabeth yeah. Bowen. Yeah. Uh, there's a great line that she has about Mary Butts who comes uh, to visit her and she says, Mary Butts has left, but the stench of her remains. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. She has written yeah. an indecent book about the Greeks and the Downs. And so I was just thinking how wonderful it would be for this entire guest list to just be people who would really piss her off. Yeah, yeah. It might Which, be nice to have half half the guest list yeah. be that. I think she would need some <laughs> some mediating, perhaps some some reasonable folk um, amongst the instigators. Um, but but certainly, it's fascinating to hear about Mansfield as well. I mean, that was quite um, a difficult relationship, um, Merve. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. Well, and she am I remembering correctly? Didn't Mansfield die right as she was writing Mrs. Dalloway too? Yeah. I, think. I don't know. Um, uh, I have to. Look, I have. I have this annotated version of Dalloway, and I look it up and take it up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no. That that was an extremely difficult relationship, and that was one that I think was more overtly marked by competition because she felt that Mansfield got better reviews and that her stories were more widely read, and she felt quite bad about that and in fact I think was composing the final chapters or the final interludes of Mrs. Dalloway after Mansfield died and that seems to me in addition to Kitty Max the inspiration for Clarissa Dalloway one of the ghosts that's clearly haunting the novel and that seems to be uh, overhanging the the wake or the party at the at the end of it but I think that I uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm coming over more to Elaine's point of view that you want to invite people who either wouldn't have wanted to be there or wouldn't have been wanted. And that that is in many ways the key to a party that people will then talk about. Yes. Because people want drama. You don't want to, you don't want some yeah. you know, quiet tea party. You want, you want yeah. drinks thrown. You want, you want fights. You Absolutely. Want, yeah, you want, you want tension. You want gossip. tension. You want gossip yeah. and you want entertainment, I think. You want a mixture of all of those things. Um, as well as our wonderful guests, I was thinking about menu as well, <laughs> uh, potentially. Um, I, I personally would love some sort of seafood, strange seafood delicacy on the menu because I think that might be a good topic of conversation. So I was wondering, um, you know, if we could imagine what the menu would look like, what one thing um, would each of you want to see on, on the menu? I'm going to come to you first, Merve. Oh, gosh. Um, I was just, I was just thinking about the what actually is on the menu or what we're told on the menu is on the menu. And the thing that I keep coming back to is the, the Tokai, the Hungarian Tokai, the wine, 
that we're told that Richard goes and fetches from the wine cellar as an emblem of the uh, of, of his imperial connections. But then I thought maybe I would just read from the end from the beginning of the party scene. I, I about the prime minister coming and then it made no difference at this hour of the night to Mrs. Walker among the plates, saucepans, colanders, frying pans, chicken and aspic, ice cream freezers, paired crusts of bread, lemons, soup tureens and pudding basins which however hard they washed up in the scullery seemed to be all on top of her on the kitchen table, table on chairs while the fire blared and roared, the electric lights glared and still supper had to be laid. And I think that reading that, you know, you're not actually getting the, you're not getting the food itself, right? You're getting the aftermath of the food, the waste of the food that's piling up in the, in the kitchen, which makes me think that they both would have eaten too much it would have been this massively decadent meal. And also like supermodels at a party today, they wouldn't have eaten anything at all. Right. <laughs> and so the menu is for me both both entirely excessive, too much, and completely non-present at the same at the same time, which which I've always found quite interesting that I can't picture the food. Well, I, I love the idea of a decadent menu. So I'm going to let that thrive in my imagination. Um, Elaine, you were going to add something? Please well, chime in. I, mean, I, I have a lot of trouble visualizing the party because it sounds, you know, the scene with the cook, which Merve just read, it sounds like it's a sit down dinner, mm. but it's described mm. as a stand up, like a cocktail party. And I'm trying to imagine them balancing this stuff and, you know, how hard it is at a real party to try to do that and juggle it. But the only dish that I can imagine having is because what I would like to have at a party in London in June, it's my favorite thing to eat in London in June. And I thought it fits with Mrs. Dowley is eaten mess. There's a lot of, you know, discussion of eaten various points and Sally Seaton has these five great sons. And I think some of them, maybe all of them are at Eaton. So I thought it would be appropriate and it's the right season. So eaten mess all over the place. That's a lovely suggestion, Elaine. Um, classic English fare. Thank you for that. Uh, Carl Bay, anything you would add to the menu? Well, I was just thinking what's funny in terms of Eaton Mess is obviously this whole conversation about a, uh, <laughs> a party with the Prime Minister is that at the moment there's this whole discussion in the UK of a party with Prime Minister, which I would have sort of so followed through. I would imagine there's a lot of drink there, as, as, as Merve says, but um, not so much in terms of uh, what's actually on the plates, but the plates themselves. I just keep thinking about the um, Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant's uh, dinner plate collection and, and just whether whether or not the differences we'll see between Mrs. Dalloway's party and Wolf's party are actually kind of like interior stylistic. And it's kind of very important for them to not have these kind of like overly overly ornate plates, but actually, yeah, there's an, there's an artistry in it. And it's, essentially, it's a cool party, which which brings me back to, to Tilda Swinton, I think. There is... As you were saying before, there is a, a very there's a stylistic sense of what has to be what has to be going on here, which seemingly Wolf was was you know distracted by, concerned with, but that's what her you know that that's what her her scene that's what her scene was. These were people who wanted to be you know they wanted to be seen as as like the cool you know the cool ones. This is this is this is what's uh, this is what's quite important to them. Um, which I think, yeah, it just it throws up very, very clear distinctions between uh, at least how I view Mrs. Dalloway's party. Um, and I think and potentially is Wolf's party going to be kind of a younger crown? Are we... Hmm. We, we like to be fair and intergenerational. I mean, I imagine it'd be quite a cool party mm -hmm. uh, and one that everybody would want an invite to. So, I mean, you could potentially have quite a young crowd, but in terms of who she moved around with, perhaps slightly older as well. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be, it'd be nice to have a good a good mixture of both. Um, but already it's like a scintillating, scintillating party yeah. um, and guest list. Um, lastly, I want to just um, talk briefly um, about Virginia Woolf's influence. Um, she's a writer who continues to loom largely in our imaginations and, you know, continues to inspire future generations. So I wondered if each of you could just touch on how she's inspired um, your work um, and your creativity. Uh, I'm going to come to Kabe first this time. Yeah, I mean, I, my work with Wolf originally started about sort of, I don't know, like 12 years ago now. I was quite a lot younger um, and I didn't think I would come back to it. But in the last couple of years, I've kind of come back to it in quite a big way. Um, 
which kind of looms ever present. But as I say, I think it's something that I'm so inspired by and interested in is actually this question of influence and how she influences um, generations afterwards and not necessarily, I mean, well, actually not even necessarily just in just in literature. There was something I wanted to bring up at the party. Uh, I don't know who who would maybe raise this potentially. It could be um, yeah, Tilda Swinton again might be might be a, a, a good suggestion point. But uh, I in terms of the connections between Carmichael and Wolf, I discovered that if anyone can picture the character Susie Carmichael in The Rugrats, she's actually, it turns out, named after Stokely Carmichael and uh, another Nickelodeon cartoon, Doug, if anyone ever remembers Doug. Um, Doug's older sister, uh, Judy, is actually named after Judith Shakespeare. So, you know, it, it, there, is, there is a sense there are, there are so many different ways that we can, like, take these threads through through time and it doesn't have to be sort of uniquely connected to the to the, you know, a modernist writer doesn't have to inspire a modernist writer. Um, so certainly from my point of view, it's this idea that the differences between me and Virginia Woolf, the fact that she can inspire me despite those, I think is, is, uh, is very important to me. And that's something that I'm just very interested in seeing how that connects to other people and, and their work and the way she, she is a presence there. Wonderful. Um, Elaine, I'm gonna to come to you next. Well, I first read Woolf um, when I was an undergraduate in a, in a course taught by a particularly conservative and unimaginative professor. Um, and we read Mrs. Dalloway and she said that it was about learning to be a help to your husband, um, which I think is not an interpretation that any of us would apply now. But one of the things that was always um, important to me was the sense of how uh, Anglo-American in a sense Wolf was and Mrs. Dalloway certainly, because of course there are manuscripts both in the United States and in and, and in the UK and research that I did, I've done research and looked at the manuscripts in the Berg collection of the New York Public Library, which was when I, when I first looked at it was really a shrine. Everybody, you know, all the feminist scholars wanted to read Wolf and all of us were in there in this hushed sanctuary being very careful not to touch anything because if we did, you know, the, the, the very stern head of the Berg collection would come in and yell at us and scold us. And then reading the manuscripts in the British Library, which are magnificent, and you're bound, and you can sort of turn over the pages, very luxurious. And the manuscript, uh, Mrs. Dalloway, there were two different editions, the American and the British. Um, so I have a kind of identification with that as, as an American who also feels very Anglo a lot of the time. Lovely. Merve, I'm going to come to you. Yeah, maybe I'll actually flip what Elaine said, which is as an American who lives in the UK and who finds a great deal of it baffling, very, very strange. The, the process of annotating Mrs. Dalloway was actually extremely educational for me. I, it was an incredible education in understanding things about the history of the UK, but also the particular role that the institution where I work, Oxford, has played in the imagination of many people in the UK and the role that it played in Wolf's imagination. And it helped me understand both what I find uh, puzzling or inscrutable and what I feel a kind of deep antipathy to, which are these continuing legacies of its role in propping up colonial administration. And I continue to find Mrs. Dalloway extraordinary for the way that imperialism is written into the details of that novel. That part of what I learned annotating it was that every statue that you see, um, that, you, that you read the name of as Peter Walsh is walking down the street, or every person who is named at the party has some kind of a pernicious tie to the state wow. and to its projects of colonialism and genocide in many cases. And so I think, again, just to play off of what Elaine was saying um, and that, that kind of fascinatingly horrible interpretation of Mrs. Dalloway as being a novel <laughs> about being your husband's helpmeet, I think one of Wolf's legacies that we can recover is her extraordinary political imagination and her capacity for political satire and particularly satire and critique of the colonial project, traces of which are still here, are still present 
today, whether that's in the form of statues or institutions of higher education. Mm-hmm. Is that too is that too polemical? Did I end up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's it's, like it's it. wonderful. No, um, Elaine, were you going to respond? Is that, was anyone going to respond? Or I was just sort of thinking, you know, that one of the things that I really love reading Merveille's annotated Mrs. Dalloway, which is so thorough. And I mean, but there are things that that you pick up that I would have passed over because I'd have thought, well, everybody knows this. You don't have to annotate it, but you have to annotate everything. And there's an entry for the Bodleian Library very early on. And I, I didn't remember that that was in Mrs. Dalloway, but it is, it's just mentioned in passing. And when you talk about it, you said the second largest library and all kinds of information about it. So I do think that, you know, there's a way that you can unpack or locate, you can, you can be attentive to so many of these references um, which could simply be like the air, maybe to a native. Fascinating stuff. Yeah, I also, to, to add to that, I, I was, I, I think what's really interesting about this, this party setup in terms of what you said, Mervé, is that kind of as Wolf scholars, you have this interesting, um, this, this dual recognition of Wolf as a person and then, and then as a writer in terms of her work. And it, 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 yeah, I find it so funny and kind of fun that we're, so much of what we've been talking about is how she would respond to people and, and the kind of like strange ways, you know, people who you would think of as like, yeah, contemporaries that she, I don't know, on the face of it, you know, she's referencing the work, she's positive about the work, but she's very scathing about them as people, um, which, yeah, I've always found like quite uh, something that really draws me to her as a writer, that there is that like that, that strange tension there. But it's when it's when you actually really, which as I did with the poem, as you see, is you really, really get into the text and you you kind of can appreciate her as a as a writer and as a thinker in a way that means you often will then have to leave behind all the you know the kind of things about her that maybe interest us more as as like you know particular wolf scholars or people into into her in that way um and yeah and i just yeah i just totally agree with what you're saying about the 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 interest in where the colonialism fe- features in mrs Dalloway and the way you can read that in the text mm. Thank you all for your wonderful contributions. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I mean, I could mine your brains endlessly about this intriguing prospect of a a dinner party uh, with Virginia Woolf. It's it's, it's absolutely amazing. Um, Thank you, everyone. It's been a joy to to talk to you uh, and hear your insights about this potential (laughs) dinner party. Uh, Dalloway Day is a fantastic day that we love to celebrate at the RSL. Uh, Please join us again next year where we will be doing the same thing reimagining how we celebrate uh, Virginia Woolf in interesting and fascinating ways a writer that continues to be at the forefront of the site guys uh, thank you so much for joining us and see you next year thank you thanks guys bye